right. We have Dr. Watt on the podcast today. And um, as, I, as I just mentioned in the intro, a little bit about his background, but I want Dr. Watt to share with us uh, his, his personal journey and um, how he got to the point of, of, of having his practice that he has now and uh, some of the problems within healthcare. And then um, Dr. Watt has a unique skill set in helping um, some patients that have headaches and migraines. And so we, we partnered together, so we'll get into that as well. But go ahead and tell me a bit about your personal journey, uh, starting from, uh, I think it was optometry school or even before that, and, and then uh, some of those realizations you had within uh, your, your own deficits and then how that led to your career path. Yeah, so growing up, I, I struggled with reading. I struggled in school. I smart kid, but never got the grades to necessarily show that that was the case. And I went to, I'm the second of six kids. I went to an optometrist every year growing up. Uh, all my siblings needed glasses, but I never did. I always had 2015 vision. And so I just kind of chugged on through and he'd be like, oh, this is the year we're probably gonna need glasses, Josh. And, Turned out that wasn't the case, and he'd kick me out every year and be like, oh, you made it through another year, see you next year, you'll probably need glasses again. And I was, like I said, I kinda, I didn't, I didn't mind school, I just didn't like school, and definitely anything reading related, I like to learn, and I really loved that aspect. Um, but fast forward, I was, you know, made it through high school and into college and through college and into optometry school. And I hate to tell anybody this, but it's true. So I did all that without ever reading. I, I never, never read a book. I always just, I had to learn to learn differently and I figured my way through. But I was in optometry school uh, in my binocular vision class. And my professor was going through a, a symptom checklist and basically said, you know, and these are the kids, get, they get red eyes and tired eyes and they're slow readers and they avoid reading and they get headaches and they fall asleep and low comprehension and on and on and on, I'm like check, 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 check. Oh no, I think I have a problem. And so at the age of 25 is when I figured out that I had problems with my eyes and my eyes weren't working together the way that they should. And so I went through vision therapy at the age of 25. And all of a sudden after going through that, I could sit down and read and study and remember what I read and not have a headache after reading for more than 10 to 15 minutes. And that was, that was my biggest problem is I could read, like I said, I was illiterate, but I would fall asleep after 10 minutes, 15 minutes of reading. If I read past that, I would get a headache or my eyes would start to really hurt. Um, and, but it really, it really kind of kicked me off. I was like, my parents did the right thing. They took me to an eye doctor every year growing up. I always, you know, checked out, everything was fine. My eye doctor said everything was good. I had 2015 vision, like what could have been wrong? And so I, uh, I realized at that point, I was in optometry school that this is what I wanted to do. I wanna catch these kids at a younger age, figure out what was going on and, and deal with it and not have them stumble across it randomly at 25 years old. Yeah, what, what age is that typically that you're catching this? So I'm usually seeing this stuff now, um, I would say seven to 10 years old it tends to be a, a fairly good age range. That I'm seeing a lot of this stuff. I mean, this stuff is happening sooner than that, but I, you know, everybody kind of gives it a little bit of time and let's wait to see what happens and maybe the kid will figure things out. And, uh, if they do, great. If they don't, then you know, parents are parents are doing better. We have they have access to more resources now than we necessarily did. Yeah, yeah. So a few things about your story. A lot of the people that are listening to this podcast are the patients that we have in the clinic. They go through the healthcare system and they feel like they get to the end of it and like they're the problem because these smart doctors uh, have not provided them with an answer. And it sounds like you you had a similar experience um, and nothing against the optometrist. Um, it's just the, the, the training they're provided or how uh, they're practicing is not set up to catch the problem that you're having. And the assumption from your parents, it sounds like, was you go to an optometrist, you must not have an eye problem. Um, when really, there's there's that gap in there. The gap uh, where not everyone struggles with, with this problem, but you happen to be, and that was impacting your life, but you were just thinking, this is kind of who I am. This is what I have to work through. Um, yeah, so what what is what do you do now? What's, what has that led to? 
Yeah, so in our, my practice, and that's Impact Vision Therapy, our, we're a referral-based practice. So, uh, you know, annual eye exams, contact lenses and glasses is, is not what we do. We, we really look at a lot of the specialty type stuff. So we're looking at more of the specific visual skills that are needed for reading and learning and activities of daily life. Um, we deal with kids with reading and learning problems. We deal with kids with crossed eyes and lazy eyes. Uh, kids and adults, I should say, with crossed eyes and lazy eyes, and we deal a lot with head injuries. Uh, all of those patients um, all have certain types of deficits, visual deficits that can really come and uh, take a big hit onto, the, onto their system. And visually, that creates problems. And exactly what you just said, the medical system is not exactly designed to help these patients. Uh, optometrists, and again, that's my specialty, so I'll stick, I'll stick within my range and stay in my lane here, but most optometrists, you go to get an annual eye exam, they're looking at three things. They're looking at how well can you see with your glasses on or no glasses if you don't have glasses, right? That's the big letter chart on the wall. And can you see 2020? Awesome. Great. Let's get you behind this machine and which one's better, one or two, and they're clicking through the lenses. That's looking at now your glasses prescription. If you have glasses and any tweaks or changes that need to get to it. If you didn't have glasses before, then all right, you don't still don't need a prescription or do you need a prescription? And they finish up with that and they go, all right, we figured that part out. They then pull up the uh, slit lamp is what it's called and they put it up to your face and they shine a very bright light and look at the back of your eye and say, all right, back of your eye looks healthy. And now we've checked all three boxes. We know how well you see, we know your prescription, and we know the back of your eye is healthy. And out the door you go. Yeah. And that's where we leave it. And so unfortunately, a lot of these patients go, go through life thinking that they're doing the right thing. They right. go and get an eye exam. They're checking all the right boxes. The eye doctor says everything's fine. And the patient goes, really? You sure? The doctor's like, yeah, everything looks normal. No, no changes from last year or everything's good now. And the patient's like, dang. All right, so it's all in my head. Uh, you know, yeah, it's all, it's all in my head. That's a common thing <laughs> with our patients too. Um, it's yeah, literally, you know, the pains in your head. Um, I like I like telling them that. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. all in your head. It's yeah. all in your brain. That's where the problem is. Yeah, exactly. So then, what's what's the difference? What are what are they missing um, from that exam? Because some people, a lot of people listening, are probably well, that's your eyes. Like, what what else is there to check, right? Yeah. Well, that, that's that's some of the basic components. Uh, the other parts that we have to look at and have to take into consideration is how well you guys are working together as a team. How are they moving? How are they focusing? Right? None of that is measured on that letter chart on the wall. Uh, it doesn't tell us any of that information. It doesn't tell you your depth perception. And that's, only, that's a requirement. Depth perception uh, is dependent upon your binocularity, how well your eyes are working together. And so you, you may be able to see really clear but not have depth perception. You may be able to see really clear but have double vision. I would much rather live in a world of single vision that's blurry Mm -hmm. than double vision that's super, super clear. Double vision is so disruptive to activities of daily life. And, it's, and it's, it's one of the key components to headaches. It's one of the key components to fatigue and frustration. And so it's, you know, those, those additional visual skills, and that's, there's lots and lots of other visual skills that get involved, visual perception stuff. How does our brain process that information and understand what it is we're looking at? Um, but, but yeah, most, op uh, most optometrists are not, equipped to handle these issues. They, they know how, they just don't take the time. And, and that's, part of that, that's part of the healthcare system. Yeah. They, they get a certain reimbursement for a certain amount of time and they have to have a certain number of patients in that timeline. And so they don't, they don't ask the right questions. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as something, just asking the right questions. That was my problem growing up. My doctor, I never complained about it because I read exactly how much I wanted to, nothing. And my, my eye doctor never asked about it and so, I didn't think that there was any connection there. Vision screenings in schools or pediatrician visual screenings, those things are not sufficient. They're not looking at all those skills. And so I have a lot of patients who are asking, well, when was your last eye exam? Or when was your child's last eye exam? Like, oh, well, you know, three months ago at the school. It's like, no, that's not an eye exam. That's a vision screening. They're trying to flag big, obvious errors mm -hmm. um, and then get them to the right people. Right. And that's, even if you pass that, doesn't mean that you don't have those errors, it's just they weren't equipped to, to really look at all those other areas. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of parallel in what you're saying to um, what we see and, and what we're trying to do in our practice too, here at Novera. Um, it's almost like you're, like you're um, 
you're looking at movement and that's what that's what we're uh, that's what we say over and over on this podcast is movement is the thing that's missing. How does, how does the body function? Um, in our world, it's MRIs and x-rays and CT scans, which are all still images. Mm -hmm. And uh, when those come back clear, then you just sort of get your clean bill of health and you walk away and you have to continue with the symptoms that you have. Um, and that's where the medication comes in because then it's it's just trying to treat those symptoms, mask those symptoms, um, but without understanding what the underlying cause is. Um, so talk to me about some of the, I know you've mentioned a few, but talk to me about what someone's experiencing when when they have this issue. Yeah, so some of the most common symptoms that we see and deal with, um, you know, I was the, Primarily, I guess, uh, definitely gets triggered quite a bit is double vision. So if a patient is experiencing some of that double vision, they may see words that look like they're moving or swimming on the page while they're, while they're looking at it. Um, it doesn't have to happen all the time. It may only happen up close. It may not happen in the distance, or it may happen in the distance, but not up close. Um, and that's one that's it's very symptomatic uh, for patients. Some of them complain about it, some of them just deal with it. I had a 17 year old and I showed him a double vision demonstration that I use to help the parents kind of understand what the kid's experiencing. And, and he goes, as soon as, I show, as soon as I showed it to him, he goes, oh yeah, that's what it looks like every time I read. And mom's jaw just like practically hit the table. She turned around and punched him in the arm and, <laughs> and said, why did you tell me about this sooner? We could have got this fixed when you were younger. And his response was, I thought everybody saw that way. And it's true, we don't think about that, but we, we only know the way that we see. And so we just make the assumption that the way we see is the way that everybody else sees. And it, the fact that I've dealt with it forever means that everybody else does as well. And they're just smarter and better and harder working than I am right. in order to achieve that. Yeah, let's talk, let's talk about um, headaches specifically. Yeah. What, um, describe why someone would, could have an eye issue that would that would then manifest as head pain. Talk us kind of through that. Yeah. Um, and then the second question is, what, what are the types of headaches that you see? Like, are they from trauma? Do they just develop over time? Yeah, that, that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of headaches, uh, patients who I see who are experiencing headaches tend to be related to, I guess, one of two things, kind of that visual strain and stress. So the fact that they're working constantly on that near point, of, you know, we're spending a lot more time on phones and on computers and near, you know, near tasks, even with the kids in school. And if they don't have that focusing system, which a focusing system allows us to look out in the distance and see things clearly and then look up close and see things clearly and shift back and forth in and out. If they don't have that focusing system and that ability to do it, it can become very, very tight. And that tightness can actually lead two headaches. Um, other ones, the double vision. If you're constantly fighting and forcing your eyes to work together when they don't want to work together, and whether that's convergence or divergence or your brain's trying to have to expend or is having to expend an excessive amount of energy to shut off the information going from one of the eyes because you can't deal with it anymore, what we call suppression, um, that is also something that can lead to those headaches. So I would say a, a lot of times it's, it's related to that visual strain and stress from constantly just fighting a broken system. Now, I do have a lot of patients who we see who have experienced head injuries. And so I have, a, you know, they maybe have sought other treatments and other help and maybe have seen some improvement, but still continue to linger with some of those, some of those headaches and they're not seeming to get better. They got better and then they got worse again. Um, and some of those issues, we often see then that those kind of post-trauma uh, headaches are, could be something that's visually related as well. So whether their eyes are not lining up the way that they should, one of the, one of the ones that I see very commonly among that is a slight vertical difference between their eyes. And so they're, again, they're constantly fighting where their eyes are not lining up and not like working together. And so they're, it just creates that additional strain and stress. Yeah, yeah, what, one thing we use in our clinic to um, evaluate and understand someone's symptoms and where they might be coming from is, is how their symptoms present, how the pain presents, where, where it presents. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed anything in your practice, like um, different types of pain patterns? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so I would say a lot of the ones that I hear tend to happen in 
one of a few places, either kind of across that forehead, and I think a lot of that is that, that tension and that, that pressure and forcing, right? They can also experience that kind of behind their eyes. So that's another one. Uh, uh, patients are like, I know this sounds weird, but it's like it's coming from behind my eyes. Right? They can just kind of feel that pressure and that tension. And I, and I think a lot of that is that as their brain, as their eyes are trying to pull and work together. The other one that I'll often experience and have patients complain about is one in the back, kind of that occipital type headache. Um, you know, in the occipital uh, lobe is where a lot of the visual processing is happening. I don't think it's necessarily related to that. I think it actually relates more to the neck and the fact that we're trying to lock down the rest of our body, the rest of that system, and so they're trying to just increase that proprioceptive feedback and going and locking down that, that system. And so it actually is triggering that. I think their body and their brain is trying to figure out, how can I get by without using my eyes? Well, if I can drive more proprioceptive feedback, I don't have to rely as much on visual feedback that's right. coming. And so then it kind of creates this cycle. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, we talk about that a lot on the podcast as well, that uh, all these systems are intertwined. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, our, our brain is controlling all of it. And so our, our brain wants the signal to, to be understandable, to interpret it, and, uh, and not have to work that hard. And so when these systems are dysfunctional, um, like when one system is dysfunctional uh, over time, it will impact these other systems. And so um, maybe at the onset of maybe the, the eyes being dysfunctional, um, the neck would feel fine, but as time goes on, uh, the, there's tension that builds up uh, because, like, um, and correct me if I'm off here, but if the if your visual input, uh, let's say, because you're looking at a phone or, or whatever, like, if if your head um, needs to accommodate to whatever visual stimulus is coming in, that accommodation through your head is going to impact your neck, and so your neck might be uh, under stress. Uh, when it doesn't need to be. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, we, we've got all these systems. So last podcast, uh, we talked about airway. Um, eventually, I'll, I'll have a dentist on that will talk about your occlusion and how your teeth contact each other, which impacts the jaw. Um, but here we've got our visual system and how that plays into uh, tension throughout the head and the neck. Um, so yeah, so you've seen that back of the head uh, headache or that pain pattern uh, improve just by treating the visual system. Yeah, yeah, and it's just you know it's reducing that we, we can if we can alleviate that stress off the brain, that system again can finally relax, right? And then if that relaxes, then sometimes that neck can sort its way back out and start to figure out okay here we go, right? Other times this is when we work together, right? It's it's them saying hey this patient has had this going on long enough. I would be corrected the visual aspects. Right. That could be triggering these problems. Now we need to send them off to you, another provider, then to get to get that help on the neck. Right. Right. To get things sorted out. To help yeah. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So um, talk about what what treatment kind of looks like. Um, what's the process that you take people through to to correct this? Yeah. So we do a, a really in depth visual evaluation where we're really good diving into a lot of those different visual skills and factors that I brought up earlier, um, and and so it's a it's not a 15 minute eye exam, unfortunately. It, you know, it takes time to kind of go through those and really dive into those different areas. We look at vision and how does it impact balance? We look at vision and how does it impact your, your depth perception? How does it impact your processing? There's cognitive components that get involved that the vision can, deficits, visual deficits can lead to some of those cognitive declines. Um, and so we really dive into a lot of those different areas. And my practice, we're huge about education. So we really want the patients to understand what's going on. And so it's, it's helping them to understand from the beginning that this may not just be related to a, you know, this isn't just on the eye chart. We have to look at all these different skills, all these different areas. As we go throughout that, that evaluation process, we then determine what's the, what's the appropriate method of action? How do we go through the treatment? Um, and so that sometimes that can, talk, that can look like just a change in prescription of the glasses, you may be utilizing some prisms or tints, uh, so different color in the glasses, or prisms which kind of shift the way the eyes can work together and the brain can start to get feet, visual feedback from that system. Um, and then we also get involved with some vision therapy. And that therapy is the process of retraining the brain to control the eyes again. And, and that's, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's where we kind of go to as, as, if, if we can, because long term, our goal is to fix these issues. And I tell every patient, nothing personal, but I never want to see you again. 
you know, so my goal is to fix them and, and be done, not have them have to come back and see me, you know, three, five, ten years later. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. I bet people like that. Yeah. 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 But it also sounds like there's there's work to be done. Um, I mean, it's an extensive process. Like, yeah, it takes time. It's, it's yeah. not something that's just a, a, a quick little magic pill or, you know, a quick little pair of glasses and all of a sudden, boom, I'm, I'm healed. Yeah. It, it takes time to go through and build up those pathways and connections. Yeah, there's, there's a trend here because um, I would say more of the Western medicine model is that quick fix. Mm -hmm. You know, we put a ton of money into researching the latest and greatest pill that um, can, can have a dramatic impact on your life. But uh, I think what's tried and true is, is like, you know, I tell people we sell crock pots, not microwaves, you know, it takes time. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's hard work, but it's work worth doing. And so I think uh, the trend here is that people that if you truly want to improve your health, like it just takes work to get there, right? Um, now, yeah, I would, I would, but I would imagine the sooner we intervene, the easier it is, is that right. true? Yeah. yeah, yeah, because again, we find adaptations. Yeah, we find ways to where we don't have to get a certain system involved anymore. We start to shut down that system, and then that leads to other problems, other coping mechanisms that then we have to kind of break that down and try to develop some other strengths in order to build that back up. Yeah. So let's talk about talk to the um, mom or dad that that has a kiddo, maybe seven to ten. Um, what are some things, one, that they can look for, and two, um, that maybe you see as like, whether it's like, you know, looking at your phone or uh, being on your computer, um, just give them some tips of things to avoid or things to watch for. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, what do we see with a lot of kids is now they're being subjected to so much more near point stress. I mean, you think back to when you were a kid, when I was a kid in elementary school, they didn't have copiers, and so everything was copying down from the board. And so we were constantly shifting from distance to near, back and forth. Now we're constantly looking up close. These kids, the teacher does a very little amount of teaching in the distance before they go, okay, well, you have three worksheets on your desk, so get to work on them, and she'll walk around the room and, and monitor the kid, make sure they're on task, right? right. Uh, and so these kids are being subjected to a lot more of that, just that near point, that near focus, the near work, and because then they leave school, after getting it all day at school, they go home and they go play a video game. They, on top of the you know 45 minutes, an hour of homework that they have, they then go, you know, older kids, they have their phone and they sit there and then look at their phone and do whatever they do on their phone for after school. And so it's just, it, all this stuff just kind of builds up. And so, you know, one of the things that, that we look for in these kids is, you know, how much time are they spending up close? Trying to get that break, trying to get that visual break on them and see what changes in their symptoms. And if their symptoms improve, then we know, okay, yeah, if you're using your visual system that long and it's not working the way that it should, it's gonna start to make things worse, right? So decreasing some of that things, some of that near focus can help to eliminate some of that visual strain and stress. Um, you know, other symptoms though to look for is, you know, kids with abnormal reading postures. Mm. So you see the kid who starts off, you know, with their hand on their cheek and they finish reading with their hand covering their eye or they read and they drop their head down onto their arm on the table, right? And they go, or they tilt or turn their head in weird positions or postures. Uh, all those can be signs of a binocular vision dysfunction. If their eyes are not working together, they're compensating, they're figuring out how to try to get their eyes to, to either work together or get it to shut off. So I don't have to fight it anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, what are some other some other ones? Are, you know, kids who are older and they're and they're still still struggling with reading, um, and you know you've gone through and they've looked at uh, you know remediation and they've gotten help and their phonics and this and that and their reading is still just subpar. Uh, there could be a visual issue that's keeping them from being able to improve. Uh, kids who read with their fingers. If they're if you're in fifth grade and you're still re reading with your finger to go across the page, that's not right. You, sh you shouldn't you should be doing that still at that age. You should have the visual skills that are necessary to be able to control your eyes to move it accurately across a paragraph while you're reading. Yeah. Um, you know, headaches, we, we've already talked about, you know, if the kid's complaining about headaches and it's like, it doesn't make any sense why these headaches are coming, or the headaches only happen on school days. Right. Right. If it's a headache on Monday through Friday and the weekends, you never hear of a headache, 
hmm, wonder what could be causing that. There may be some visual strain that's, that's the trigger point for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so someone's listening to this and they, they think, well, you're, you're describing me. Uh, that's the type of headache I have. Um, you know, your story resonates with my story. Like, what, what do they do from here? Who do they look for? Um, because we talked about a general optometrist might not cut it. And so, um, yeah, what, what should they search for? Yeah, so there's a couple of organizations which have some doctor locators where you can look for this stuff. So if you look at the, the title, everybody kind of calls themselves a little bit different thing, but it's all within the same ballpark. So a behavioral optometrist or a developmental optometrist or neuro optometrist, kind of those three terms are ones that typically get kind of thrown around. And it generally means that they're going to be looking at some of these factors a little bit more acutely and a little bit more in depth. Um, some organizations, there's an organization called the College of Optometrists and Vision Development, COVD. Um, if you go to the website, covd.org, they have a doctor locator where you could go and search for a provider near you uh, who is experienced in those. And I, I would say, again, generally most of the providers on there do a good job, especially if you bring up the concern. Right? A lot of this is, you know, just putting that out there, right? Just telling the doctor, here's, here's some of my concerns. And the doctor will be like, oh my goodness, yeah, let's look at these other areas. Unfortunately, doctors get busy and they just start to go through their routine. And so even if you're getting a regular eye exam with a, you know, a COVD doctor and you don't mention anything, they may, not, they may not necessarily look at all that stuff. So if you prime them and say, hey, I have concerns about my kids reading or I have headaches or I get double vision in this, in this scenario or in this case, uh, that doctor should then clue in and say, okay, we need to spend a little bit more time and dive into this stuff more in depth. Yeah, yeah. And then for someone in Colorado Springs who wants to, to utilize your services, what, where do they go or what do they do? Yeah, so you can go to our website, impactvisiontherapy.com. Um, we have examples on our website of some of these visual conditions that we're seeing and, and treating um, and then finding the additional information on our website there. And you know, we're, we're happy to see and work with any patient to try to help them get on their path to recovery and like I said, not, not stumble across this, so hopefully later on in life, get, the, get these problems fixed at a younger age, but even if it is later on in life and they're dealing with this, uh, a very common misconception is these problems that once they're, once you're you know, older than seven, eight, nine years old, eh, you can't really deal with much of this. It, it is what it is, and that's just not true. Um, so we've dealt with adults with crossed eyes and lazy eyes um, into their you know, 65, 70 year old. I've dealt with a, a 94 year old with Parkinson's uh, who all he wanted to do was be able to play his trumpet and he couldn't read his sheet music anymore. His tracking skills were bad enough that he couldn't follow the music. And so we were able to work with him and get his eye movements to improve. And that's in a 94 year old with degenerative, with a degenerative disorder. Um, so the, the myth that this is something that has to be only dealt with at a younger age is not true. And opportunities exist even at, at any stage of life. The brain is plastic. If it's that neuroplasticity, we can change it. And, and make things better. Yeah, I love it because that's that's what we're about. I mean, we say this stuff on our podcast all the time. So I appreciate you being on the podcast um, and we'll continue to, yeah, make the world a better place by making people healthier. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity.